So we've talked about regulation of fluids, the distribution of the fluids. We've talked about regulation imbalances like edema and hyper, hypotonic situations. Now we're going to talk about the electrolytes. When we look at the electrolytes, first thing you need to do is look at electro and think they're charged, like electrical. And here you have the sodium, which has a positive, potassium with a positive, calcium with a double positive, hydrogen with a positive. That means these have all lost an electron and they have a slightly positive charge, actually a positive charge, like this. We call them cations, and when I see the word cation, I always think of a plus in the middle where the T is at. And then the anions, chloride, this one's a little bit more tricky, it's bicarbonate, and then phosphate. These are anions, they have a negative charge. So if you remember, cations have the plus, then the others have to be anions. And then there are some other things we'll talk about that are technically non-electrolytes because they either don't have a charge or they're slightly polar. Kind of like water, H2O, is not technically charged, it's slightly polar. Proteins typically are slightly polar. Sometimes you'll hear them having a charge, like a negative charge. But we'll talk about these and what they can do to electrolytes too. So the first thing you want to think about is the comparison of the intracellular and the extracellular fluids. So when you're looking at the cations, especially things like sodium and potassium, look at where they're at. You have to make sure that you're paying attention to where the balances are. And if you had physiology with me, I always push this lame little um, thing to put in your head, but a cell is like an island, and it sits in a surrounded by salt water. So when you're sitting on the island and you're looking at the salt water, what is salt? I mean, salt is sodium and chloride. So all that water that surrounds your little island is sodium chloride. So in the extracellular fluid around your little island cell, you have lots of sodium and lots of chloride. On this, on this island that you're on, it's just covered with banana trees. And why do I say banana? Because you think potassium, right? So inside the cell, the intracellular fluid is going to be really high in potassium. And this chart's really handy because it'll break down each of these for you. Like sodium, you can see the extracellular fluid, lots and lots, but inside of a cell, barely anything. Potassium, the intracellular fluid is really, really high, but the extracellular fluid is very low. And you can go all the way through. So when you look at some of the chemicals that are inside, or the electrolytes that are inside of a cell, you've got potassium, you've got a lot of magnesium, you've got a lot of phosphates. Those are really high inside the cell. When you look at outside the cell, you can see really high sodium, really high chloride, and then a lot of bicarbonate too, comparatively. So just as an example or a, a review chart there. So you want to remember a couple things. That the body fluids stay electrically neutral. Where at in the body can shift between the cells and the extracellular fluid. So remember things like neurons and muscles actually use a charge different across the membranes. But overall, your body also means maintains osmotically balanced fluids. Some of the terms that we're going to use, molecular weight when we use this is just talking about how heavy the particle is. And you've seen these two in the last video. The milliequivalents we're going to use usually when we're measuring the volume of an electrolyte in your plasma. And then milliosmoles, we'll also use that to talk about the osmolarity. So uh, when we talk about things like sodium, we'll talk about how your milliequivalents of sodium should be about 140. And then we'll talk about the balance or osmolarity of the, the fluids is typically around what number, which you already know. Most of the fluids in your body are right around 300 milliosmol. Right? So when we talk about the milliequivalents, usually it's identifying one electrolyte where milliosmoles is usually talking about the osmolarity collectively. Right, the first electrolyte, sodium. And you probably remember all the purposes of sodium, but what I'm going to do with each of these, these electrolytes is I'm going to remind you of the physiology and then kind of ask you or pull out of you, how do you get these things in your body? So what would cause a deficit? Maybe not bring the, the electrolyte into the body or what organ usually clears electrolytes? The kidney. So what would probably happen in an imbalance? Maybe the kidney is getting rid of too much or can't get rid of too much. So first I'm going to talk about sodium. And sodium, remember the primary extracellular fluid cation because it has what charge over it? Positive. And you like to maintain right around 140 milliequivalents. So 136 to 145 is the safe range. If it goes under, what would you call it? Would you call it hyper, hypo, or iso? Yep, so you would call it hypo, it's too low. And then you would say NAT, NH, and then remia. So hyponatremia means low salt in the blood or sodium in the blood. And then over here you would have hypernatremia. Remember the emia at the end is referring to the blood. So it tells you first the tone, how much of the particle, hypo or hyper, then it says NH for sodium, and I always think Na plus for the NAT, 
and then anemia in the blood. And then the physiological roles of sodium, remember, probably when you took your physiology, we beat you to death with sodium and the action potential. So sodium, when you're thinking about neurons, sodium goes in and creates an action potential by doing what to an action potential? Does it hyperpolar? Does it depolar? Does it repolar? It depolarizes. It actually starts the electrical activity down the action potential. So sodium is really important for triggering it. And the reason I'm pointing these out is because when you look at hypernatremia, too much sodium, what do you think is going to happen? You think you're going to decrease the depolarization or increase it? So now you have more sodium in the environment. That sodium wants to race into the cell even faster. You're going to depolarize more frequently. So what would you expect to happen to neurons in a hyperpolar situation? Would they, would they fire more frequently or less frequently? Do it fire more frequently? So when you look at the pathophysiology, as long as you understand this physiology and what's going on over here, you can actually break it. You can say, hey, I've got too much of this or too little of this, and you can predict what's going to happen. And they tell you the symptoms, and you'll see as we go through this. I'm spending a little more time on sodium, and then I'll, I'll move a little bit quicker in the other electrolytes because I'm really pushing that you open your mind during this and think about what are the possibilities. So the physiological roles with, with sodium, it helps maintain osmotic balance. Remember, sodium, glucose, proteins are some of the things that really pull water. So where you see a lot of sodium, it's going to pull a lot of water too. Uh, nerve conduction, muscular function. Remember, the membrane on the outside of the muscle is the same way. It's stimulated by sodium. It has an action potential. And it'll help regulate acid and base balance. So I'm going to walk right through these. And the first, remember the actions. So here you know that sodium is responsible for the action potential propagating down the axon. You also know that it's responsible for the action potential at the neuromuscular junction. So here you have the membrane of the muscle. The action potential shoots along, goes down in, and allows that muscle to fire. But you also have to think about with cardiac muscle. Sodium racing in on cardiac muscle, remember, causes depolarization too. So those are important physiological functions. So again, if you have an increase in sodium, what would you have to expect to happen to the frequency of depolarization? So lots and lots of sodium here, very little sodium here. You raise the sodium even more out here, still very little here. What's going to happen to the rate of diffusion in as soon as you open these membranes? It's going to go faster, right? So it goes faster. What would you expect to happen to the neuron firing? More frequently or more intense firing. So it's going to have more frequent firing, which you expect things like maybe irritability, kind of an anxious feeling. You might expect at a muscle more like contractions, more forceful contractions, more frequent contractions, maybe some tetany. So those are the things you'd expect with too much sodium in your extracellular fluid. It's going to race into these cells faster. Maybe a little bit more forceful contraction of the heart, or frequency of the heart. I shouldn't say contraction because that's actually calcium, but more, more frequent contraction of the heart or faster heartbeats. All right, so those are just some ideas to think about. So now let's talk about how you regulate sodium. So sodium is regulated by aldosterone, but don't forget why aldosterone is released. It's released if you have low sodium, because it's going to try and pull the sodium back in, but it's also released because your blood pressure drops. So aldosterone will regulate sodium, but there are more than one cause for it to be released. So you just have to keep in mind when aldosterone changes, your sodium is going to change with it. And then don't forget those other chemicals like atrial natriuretic peptide or atrial natriuretic hormone. I know your books use the word A and H before, but just the opposite of aldosterone, what does A and P do to sodium? it makes you lose it. So if you had a disorder that you released way too much A and P, what would you expect to happen to your sodium levels in your blood? They would drop. If you had a disorder where you could not release A and P, what would you probably predict about sodium levels? They'd probably go up. So you can predict what's going on. Another thing about aldosterone is you can't forget that sodium is not the only chemical re regulated by aldosterone. It's also controlled by potassium. So if you have well, let's walk through this pump again. Remember, aldosterone turns on this pump and it pulls sodium into your blood, but at the same time it kicks potassium out. So why would potassium turn on aldosterone? Well, if you had really high potassium here in the blood, it would turn on aldosterone to kick the potassium out, potassium flow into the nephron, and then flow out of the body. So as you have high potassium and you're kicking out the potassium because of aldosterone, what's happening to your sodium levels at the same time? Those are raising. 
So you might see an outcome of hyperkalemia, so too much potassium turning on aldosterone, dropping your hyperkalemia down to normal levels, but what would rise at the same time? Sodium. So you might see hypernatremia as an outcome of hyperkalemia. So you just have to keep, keep in mind, this is a domino effect. One structure affects another and another. One chemical can affect more than one ion. All right, so let's do some application. What are the two types of hyponatremia? Well, think about it. If you have a liter of fluid and you have salt in it, if I don't change the number of particles of salt, is it possible that I could change um, the concentration of salt? Yeah. You don't have to change the number of particles to change the concentration. They're two totally different concepts. So when you're looking at, let's say you have a million particles of salt. By the way, your normal serum sodium, remember, is supposed to be 136 to 145. So in this situation, we've actually dropped below 135. We've gone down too low. How can we do that? Well, we can either lose the salt. So think about the causes. If you have less salt than normal, what could be the cause? Where do you get salt from? diet. Maybe you're not taking enough salt in. How do you lose salt? Primarily through the kidney or through sweating. So you could be doing excessive sweating. You could be losing lots of it through the kidney. Okay, maybe aldosterone is not working. So those are some possible causes. You want to think about either you're not getting sodium in or you're losing sodium too fast. It's the sodium that's the problem. It's a little bit different than dilutional. Dilutional is saying that water is actually the issue. Maybe you're putting in way too much water. Your number of sodium particles is the same, but now the concentration of sodium drops. Right? So things like kidney failure might cause that. It, with kidney failure, if you're not urinating, you're retaining more and more water, even through metabolism. Remember, you're making water, you're drinking more water. And then what happens is you dilute all the solutes. So it looks like you have hyponatremia, but in this situation, it's because of water. So when you look at this, kidneys are the kind of the primary target with dilutional. So maybe you have something called SIADH. It's called symptom of inappropriate ADH. You release too much ADH. What does ADH do? It's an antidiuretic, which means you retain water. You keep water, and it dilutes your salt. So SIADH. It could be oligouric renal failure. Oligouric means decreased kidney function, decreased urine output, basically. So you're retaining more water. It could be things like se severe congestive heart failure. You're not pumping blood to the kidney, so the kidney can't get rid of that extra water. All these, you can see, revolve around kidney issues. So ADH working on the kidney, the kidney slowing down urine output, or blood getting less blood getting to the kidney. Another problem could be excessive sweating. But it's not the sweating that causes the problem, because when you sweat, you lose electrolytes and you lose water. It's isotonic. The problem is that when people do a lot of sweating, you get really thirsty, and usually they go for that bottle of Evian, and they put pure water back in them. But what's the problem? They lost electrolytes, and now they're putting pure water in. So you have to think of that. That's dilutional. And then here, hyperglycemia, and this is kind of a tricky one, but with hyperglycemia, you're putting more sugar in the blood, and what's going to happen is that sugar in the blood is going to do what? Remember, sugar, salt, and proteins do what with water? They all pull it. So now you have too much water in the blood, it's because of the sugar. But proportionally, it looks like you have low salt because you have too much sugar and too much water. So you can see how these situations can be kind of tricky when you're using the terminology. Right? So of course, who's at risk with the hyperglycemic situations? I'm hoping you're thinking diabetics. Right? And then we already talked about water intoxication, or technically you looked it up. So dilutional, one of the symptoms or signs you're going to see is that you're going to have hypervolemia, too much water hyponatremia. But with depletional, what you find is that when there's less salt, there's usually less water. So here you see usually hypovolemic symptoms, so a decreased uh, blood plasma. And you can think of this with the pathway in the cells. If you have less salt in the blood and more water, that's a what type of situation? It's a hypotonic situation. Where's that water going? Is the water going into the cells or is the water going into the blood? Remember, with hypotonic, the water's moving from the blood out here and going into the cells. It's being sucked in, so you're losing blood volume. So just kind of think about the pathways when you're looking at these. All right, so other clinical manifestations of hypo hyponatremia, kind of already talked about this. When you think neurons, with hyponatremia, 
decreased sodium. You need sodium to cause this action potential, remember? So if you have less sodium, what would you expect of the frequency of action potentials? They would decrease. How would you feel if your neurons fired less? You probably feel tired, sleepy. You might have headaches, confused about where you're at. And we'll talk about these things when we talk about the nervous system too. Your hypothalamus starts shutting down, so your temperature starts dropping, depressed reflexes, and then you start seizing, going to coma, and if it's not corrected, you could die. So think of the pathway, and I just explained the pathway, right? When you think about muscles, they get cramps and weakness and fatigue. Remember, you need sodium to go in to fire these muscles too. So you usually see these with skeletal muscles, right? And then some gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, it's affecting the medulla oblongata, cramping, some diarrhea. And the diarrhea, this is kind of tricky because with diarrhea, this can actually be a cause, right? You're losing the sodium, so the sodium can't get into your blood, causing hyponatremia. So it's an interesting concept with the GI tract. But again, when we talked about the um, organs or the systems that help regulate fluids and electrolytes, just go back and think about them. So how is it possible that, you know, what's going on with the neurons? What's going on, sorry, central nervous system? What's going on with the skeletal system? What's going on with the GI tract? You can think about what's going on with the integument system too. All right, so the first question in this set, so question number six all together, is what are some hyper natremia alterations. So when you think of it, I just explained hypo, and I want you to either look up on the internet, you can look up on your book, I don't care, but in hypernatremia, what would you expect the serum sodium level to be? What number? So how many milliequivalents? Okay. What system could have caused hypernatremia? And of course you want to think about bringing in salt, putting out salt, right? I'm, I feel like I'm giving away the answers, but I really want you to do a little bit of the footwork and, and figure these out. Uh, what happens to the sodium level and the water level of the plasma? So when you have hypernatremia, what would happen to the salts? You've already figured that out back here. What's going to happen to the water as a result? So what would happen to the cells is what you want to think too. All right? Why would it give you hypo or hypervolemic symptoms? So I'm not giving away which of these is going to cause, but I want you to figure out, will they have hypovolemic or hypervolemic symptoms, and what's actually doing that? So think about the cells and how it's affecting the cells, like I just said. And then... Oops, I kind of slipped and put some things in here. Here are some, some other symptoms you could expect. So intracellular dehydration, some convulsions, pulmonary edema. So when you think about hypernatremia, why would it cause convulsions? So convulsions are typically caused by overfiring of neurons, right? So why would that happen? All right, pause it and then come back when you're done. So just a brief overview, and this is kind of a nice little review slide. It has a little extra information that you might want to look into. But So here you have hypernatremia, and the problem with hypernatremia is that either you have too much salt or too little water. Here are some, some of the possible causes. So IV therapy, acidosis, Cushing syndrome with aldosterone. Okay, This is an interesting one to spend a second on. Why aldosterone? So if you're releasing too much aldosterone, why does it cause hypernatremia? Well hypernatremia, remember, aldosterone is pulling in the sodium. Things like fever, sweating, respiratory, inf respiratory infections, these are causing you to lose water, making your salt go up. Okay. Diabetes, diarrhea, kind of like I talked about before, you're losing water. And then a decrease in water intake can actually cause hypernatremia too. So these are some possible causes. Manifestations, so water movement from intracellular to the extracellular fluid, so it's shifting kind of gave away that last slide, and then here are some of the symptoms I had on the last slide too. And then hyponatremia, remember, can be too low salt or too high water as a cause. Overall, when they're measuring the sodium, they're looking at the sodium numbers, but there can be two possible causes. And then vomiting, diarrhea, GI. This is an interesting one too, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the treatments or um, persnickety causes of some things. I'm trying to build your pathophysiology, not your, your clinical you know, details. But when they give something like this, this is actually a sugar solution. It's dextrose. So when they give a sugar solution of dextrose, it will actually cause or could cause hyponatremia. It drops your, your salt level or sodium level. And the reason is because if you remember from the GI tract and physiology, when you, whoever you turn, took physiology from, when you bring in a sugar particle, you bring in a salt particle. This is the blood-brain barrier. When the brain brings in a sugar particle, it also brings in a salt particle or sodium particle. 
So as you're pulling in the sugar into the brain, you're also pulling sodium out of the blood, causing hyponatremia. So they can actually use this as a treatment for hypernatremia, right? It's not actually fixing it, but what's happening is by putting a sugar solution in their body, they're pulling some of the salt out of the blood and putting it in other chambers like the brain. So it's just something to think about when you look at, at uh, the pathways or the, the physiology. All right, next is chloride. So what should I know about chloride? First, it's the primary extracellular fluid anion. It has a what charge then? It has a negative charge. Here are your regular values, 97 and 105 milliequivalents. It helps provide electroneutrality. Neutrality, sorry. So when you're shifting around chloride, usually it's to help balance things out. If you remember the red blood cell, they actually called it the chloride shift. So as chloride goes one direction, bicarbonate goes the other. In other words, what charge must bicarbonate have? If they're trying to move in opposite directions, they both have the same charge, keeping everything electrically neutral. So here's bicarbonate over here. As bicarbonate leaves the red blood cell, chloride goes in to keep everything electrically neutral. As bicarbonate comes back in, chloride leaves to keep everything electrically neutral. It's called the chloride shift. And then when you look at chloride in general, it likes to follow sodium. You know this because on your table you have sodium chloride, which is table salt. They like to follow each other, and they keep each other electrically neutral too. Because the sodium has a positive, the chloride has a negative, so when they stick together, they're actually neutralized. Chloride's really important because when it goes into nerves, it inhibits the nerves. When chloride flows in, it takes that resting potential and makes it more negative. Remember, to depolarize, you make it more positive. So it causes nerve inhibition, which is kind of an important point. When people take opiates, the opiates will actually allow chloride to go into a neuron, shutting them off, decreasing pain sensation. So it's an important physiological point you want to keep in mind. Right? And then even with acid base balance, your stomach secretes hydrogen chloride, H plus, Cl minus. Together they're neutralized, but when they get dumped into the water of the stomach, they separate. So it helps regulate or neutralize acids. Sorry, I should, I should say hydrogen ions. We'll talk about acids in the next section. So a couple examples of chloride. One's a disease and one's something we use in practical reality. So cystic fibrosis, the chloride transporter is broken. It's defective. So it's a genetic disorder. This transporter normally would move chloride back and forth, but something's wrong with it and it doesn't allow it to work. So chloride will build up on the outside of their cells and it won't go into the cells. When chloride builds up, it wants to hold sodium behind. And when you have chloride and sodium hanging out here, what are they both going to attract? Lots of water. So if you imagine this being the respiratory tract, and they have all this, this sodium chloride sitting along the wall of their cells, it attracts water into the respiratory tract, causing a thick mucus to build up, and it causes breathing problems. Right? You can think of the same thing with reproductive tract, the GI tract, it's the same thing. Chloride builds up on the outside parts of the body, which is the external environment, the lumen of whatever, lumen of respiratory, lumen of the GI tract, lumen of the reproductive tract, and it causes this thick, sticky mucus because chloride can't move. Right? And then anesthetics. Anesthetics, like I said, some, one example is an opiate. So opiates get in, and what they do with that resting membrane is they bring it down here. So opiates will allow chloride to come in, and it takes that resting potential and decreases it. So what actually happens with opiates are they decrease pain sensation, not completely shut it off. And then chloride imbalances hypo and hyper. General rule of thumb with hypochloremia is usually common with hyponatremia. And then hyperchloremia is usually common with hypernatremia. So they go hand in hand. And a lot of the symptoms will come hand in hand too. Um, another problem here is acid base balance. So when you talk about that bicarbonate, remember HCO3 is actually has a negative. You might want to draw that in. When you increase HCO3 negative in the blood, what should happen to chloride? Should it stay in the blood with all that other negative bicarbonate? No, it leaves. So you kick it out. So hypochloremia, a lot of times you will see with an increased bicarbonate or an alkaline, which we'll talk about in the next section, metabolic alkalosis. This bicarbonate creates a very basic environment. So hypochloremia, usually you'll see signs of metabolic alkalosis at the same time. Right? And then just the opposite. When you have a drop in bicarbonate, you have a rise in chloride. So, um, oh, sorry, one more here. I don't know why. Oh, I just realized the numbers didn't 
come out right. But anyway, a third problem with hyperchloremia is when people take too many chloride diuretics. So they're pumping lots and lots of chloride into their body and it causes issues. So next are the intracellular electrolytes. So those are the primary extracellulars. And the first intracellular, remember, highest is going to be that potassium. Huge. Remember why the potassium is important. Every time that we've talked about action potentials or a change in electrical potentials, when we talk about depolarization, repolarization, potassium almost every time is revolving around repolarization. Sodium causes depolarization. Potassium across the board causes repolarization. It helps bring the cell back to stable. So that's how you want to think about it. Where is potassium primarily at? Inside the cell. So what happens if you start increasing potassium outside the cell? Think about it. Potassium is high inside the cell. When you open doorways, potassium has a tendency to race out of the cell quickly. But what if it's crowded with potassium outside the cell at the same time? What's going to happen to the speed that potassium leaves? So if potassium is high in a cell, potassium is high outside of a cell. So here's a cell example. It's high here and high here. What's going to happen to the rate that it wants to leave? It doesn't leave very well. So when you have too much potassium out here, outside the cell, it causes repolarization issues. The cell doesn't want to repolarize. So keep that in mind. I put both of these values in here. It's an intracellular fluid cation, positive charge. Inside the cell, it's about 156 milliequivalents. But when you take a plasma sample, you're actually looking at what's in the ECF. So as on a plasma sample, you should see about 3.5 to 4.5 milliequivalents for potassium. Definitely remember the physiological roles, and I kind of covered that. I don't know what's going on with the slide here. but So it maintains neutrality. It helps with that resting membrane potential. It also helps with repolarization. So you want to think repolarization in cardiac, smooth. You want to think about neuromuscular, skeletal, and the neurons themselves. Right. And then acid-base balance. The acid and the base balance is because potassium has is a K+. Plus. There's actually a pump or a transporter that carries hydrogen and potassium. They both have the same charge, so to keep electrically neutral, how do they have to move? Opposite to each other. So, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail on a, a few slides from here, but as potassium is moving into the cell, hydrogen moves out. As hydrogen's, so when you think about this, if you're bringing potassium in, what kind of environment are you creating in the blood? An acidic environment, right? So if an acidic environment is out here, and your body starts putting the hydrogens into the cell, what's going to happen as a result? Potassium gets kicked back out. So watch the hydrogen potassium. So there's another ion exchange, hydrogen potassium. What's the other ion exchange with the potassium we talked about before? A special pump, sodium potassium pump. So now you have to think about how the ECF potassium is regulated. There are a couple primary regulators. These you may not have heard of before. So insulin, I know you've heard of insulin, but insulin affects potassium. When insulin comes out into the blood, it causes potassium to go into cells. So insulin causes sugar to go into cells, but it also causes potassium to go into cells. Right? So with somebody that has type 1 diabetes that can't make insulin, what would you expect to happen with the potassium in their body? Would their blood stay high in potassium or would it go really low in potassium? Well, if they don't have enough insulin, it, you'd expect higher potassium levels in the blood. When they take a big dose of insulin, what's going to happen to their potassium levels? They drop. Right? Remember, potassium is important for life. It affects cardiac muscle um, stability, so it could actually cause life-threatening uh, problems. Where you get potassium from? Your diet. You bring it in. How you clear it primarily? Through the urine. So diet again, GI tract, and then urine. And in between, you can put it in cells. You can maintain it with things like insulin. Catecholamines like norepinephrine. Don't forget norepinephrine and epinephrine. So epinephrine and norepinephrine work a lot like insulin on potassium. They help you store it. They push it into the cells. So if somebody's taking um, something like epinephrine, they take an EpiPen, what could you expect to happen to their potassium levels? Will they go up or go down? They go down. They drop. So what happens to a potassium level after somebody takes a beta-2 agonist? So a beta-2 agonist is increasing the activity of, of epinephrine, basically, or epinephrine receptors. What would you expect to happen to the potassium levels? If it goes down. What if they took a beta-2 blocker? What would you expect? Okay. So a beta-2 blocker, you expect to rise. 
and then here again aldosterone. Right, so affects the pH. I kind of talked about this on the last slide, but here you can see that little pump again. So in situations like acidosis, which we'll talk about in the next video, you want to kind of keep in mind with acidosis, hydrogen ions accumulate. Acids accumulate. This is hydrogen and this is an acid. So what would you expect to happen to potassium? As acid rises, these cells are going to pull hydrogen in. What are they going to do to potassium? Kick it back out. So they'll kick the potassium out. So in states of acidosis, you have to be careful because potassium levels will start going up, causing heart issues. And then alkalosis, just the opposite. So with alkalosis, you start pulling potassium into the cell and kicking the acid back out. So you'd see more of hypokalemic situations. Where in acidosis, you'll expect to see hyperkalemic situations. So some of the causes of hypokalemia, always think back about intake and output. Reduce intake of potassium, and you're not eating up bananas. You know, bananas are not the only food with potassium. But you have to worry about an increased entry into the cells of potassium, so potassium being kicked in. And remember some of the causes, insulin, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine. And then loss of potassium. So people taking lots of diuretics, urinating a lot, they lose a lot of potassium. So you have to worry about that. Refl <clears throat> Excuse me. So manifestations of hypokalemia. What you're really going to look at is ECGs because remember, potassium has a huge impact on the heart. So with neuromuscular and heart disorders, in this situation, neuromuscular with too little potassium, you get hyperpolarization, which means that there's weakness. It doesn't want to fire appropriately. The neurons start slowing down. When you look at the, the heart, what's interesting is that the heart has a special characteristic, this little thing called a U-wave. So it can cause dysrhythmias, and the U-wave's there because of repolarization issues. It doesn't want to repolarize properly. So you see a decrease in neural activity, weirdness in the heart, dysrhythmias. You see postural hypotension. So hypotension because your neurons aren't firing properly, the sympathetic nervous system can't fire, and also because the smooth muscles don't want to contract appropriately. So Instead of having, when you stand up, instead of having those muscles and neurons responding and trying to squeeze blood vessels, they don't. And your blood pressure drops and potentially push you into shock at some point, too. So the treatment, I don't usually put treatments in, but is potassium intake, but slowly, like eating potassium or taking a potassium supplement. Because as you take it in slowly, your body can get rid of the excess. If you take it in quickly, it can actually cause your heart to stop. When we, when we put people in the death, death chamber, the uh, um, lethal injection, we give them potassium chloride. We're giving them chloride to stop neurons, potassium to lose the, the uh, repolarization phase. So it stops their heart. And then hyperkalemia. You can just kind of look at the opposite of hypokalemia. But some of the main causes, renal disease, because you can't get rid of the potassium. So it builds up. Okay? It's kind of rare. Um, Addison's disease, because Addison's disease affects aldosterone. So Addison's disease, they don't have aldosterone. So they're losing lots of sodium and they're retaining lots of potassium. Oh, I missed one. Hyperkalemia, another one down here on the bottom. It's kind of important. But if potassium is primarily in the cells, what happens when you damage the cell? You'd see that potassium leak out, so it would be in the blood. So like crush syndrome, when people crush large groups of muscles, those muscles release their potassium. After a heart attack, when the heart tissue dies, it releases the potassium, so you see hyperkalemic states. And then the ECG on uh, somebody with hyperkalemia. In this situation, you don't see that little U wave, but you do see a, a marked change in the T. So if you remember, here's your P, QRS, and T. That's normal. You don't usually see a U, but you see it with hypokalemia. When hyperkalemia, you actually see the repolarization phase going up. It repolarizes a lot more dramatically. And remember, the T wave is ventricular repolarization, so you have a huge spike in repolarization. And then here you can compare. Here's normal ECG. And then you can watch in hypo or decreasing potassium. You see that U wave starting to pop out. Right? When you look at hyperkalemia, too much potassium, you can see the T wave getting more pronounced and more peak. So those are kind of trademark traits. Whoops, I didn't need that slide. Okay, calcium is the next one. And calcium. You really want to remember where calcium is at, primarily in the bone, a little bit 
in the blood and a little bit in the cells. So 99% is in the bone, is hydroxyapatite stuck to the bone. When you look at the, the uh, cells, you have 0.9% in the cells. And then that 0.1, the real teeny, teeny, tiny percent, that 4.5 to 5.5 milliequivalents of calcium is in your blood. It's regulated. Right. And then the main regulator is going to be parathyroid hormone. Yes, calcitonin helps regulate it, but parathyroid hormone imbalances can cause death. So you really want to pay attention to PTH. PTH causes your blood calcium to rise, go up. So if you are missing PTH, what happens to your blood calcium? You have hypocalcemia. If you have too much PTH, what happens to your calcium? You get hypercalcemia, right? Calcitonin pulls calcium out of the blood and sticks it to the bone. So PTH usually helps regulate the calcitonin. It's the PTH that can become life-threatening or where you have to worry about it. And before I go into the details of calcium disorders, I really want you to pay attention to the next one, phosphate. The key here is that where calcium rises, phosphate usually drops. They work inversely. So when you see symptoms of hypercalcemia, you'll usually see symptoms of hypophosphatemia. When you see symptoms of hypocalcemia, you usually see symptoms of hyperphosphatemia. They go hand in hand. So it saves you a little bit of brain space. So the phosphate levels are usually 2.5 to 4.5. When, um, when you're looking at the phosphate again, when you bring in calcium and phosphate, you actually bring them both in from the GI tract at the same time. But when you lose them, you usually lose them disproportionately through the kidney. So as you're kicking one out, usually you don't kick much of the other one out. Right? And then, like I've said before, the inverse relationship. If you look at this as being constant, so and the K plus isn't, let's just focus on constant. If this is 10 as an example, if this level here is 2 and this is 5, it comes out to 10. But if you lower this down to 2, what did you have to do to this? you had to raise it to five. They work inversely. Right? So as one goes up, the other one has to go down. So hypercalcemia, the first one. So hypercalcemia, this is another trick about calcium. Calcium actually blocks sodium channels. So when calcium and sodium are in the right levels, everything works perfectly. But when you raise the calcium, it actually blocks sodium channels. So what would you expect to happen to depolarization of neurons? It goes down as a result. So too much calcium causes neurons to decrease excitability. So you see things like skeletal muscle weakness, cardiac arrest, right? so it turns them down. If you have too much calcium, your kidney is going to try and get rid of it, and you're going to start seeing kidney stones. Right? So there are a couple main symptoms. Causes, I already mentioned this, hyperparathyroid. Parathyroid dumps calcium into the blood, so it raises your calcium. Right? Um, too much vitamin D. Remember, vitamin D helps you absorb calcium. So bringing in lots of vitamin D will actually make you bring in more calcium. What's interesting, and this is what you want to pay attention to, is that vitamin D also brings in phosphate. So this is one of those rare situations where the same cause can cause issues with calcium being too high or phosphate being too high. Right? Uh, another thing is where you store calcium in the bone. So when you start breaking down the bone, it dumps the calcium into the blood. So things like bone tumors or bone cancer can cause it. And just the opposite, hypocalcemia. So remember... Without the calcium, there's less block to sodium. So sodium moves into cells faster. So you see increased neuromuscular excitability. So increased depolarization. Right? You start seeing muscle tetany, muscle cramps, right? hyperactive muscle tissues. And with breathing, you definitely don't want those breathing muscles going to tetany because then you can't breathe. Some of the causes of hypocalcemia is renal failure. So you can't reabsorb calcium from the kidneys. Not enough of the vitamin D. Not enough of the PTH. Right? Maybe too much calcitonin coming out. Not absorbing enough calcium. So these are kind of common sense things that you can just walk through and look at. Right? So what I'm going to have you do is actually there are two signs, two physical signs that are interesting signs that happen with hypocalcemia. You're going to look up both of the signs and explain to me why they both happen. So both these happen with hypocalcemia, and you're going to look them up. Go ahead and hit pause. You can use the internet. You can use your book. It's up to you. All right, hyperphosphatemia. So I want you to think of first, hyperphosphate is usually related or going to be associated with what about calcium? Low calcium, hypocalcemia. So you can see a lot of the same causes. You'll see a lot of the same symptoms. So the best way to do this is go back and look at hypocalcemia.
Some of the causes for hypophosphatemia is if the kidneys can't get rid of it. If cells are destroyed because there's lots of phosphate in the cells. So when you see hyperphosphatemia, one of the first things you might want to look for would be kidney issues or cell damage. And then if the cells are destroyed, what's the other intracellular fluid ion? Potassium. So you might see high potassium and high phosphate indicating that it might be cell destruction. All right. And then hypophosphatemia, of course, you want to look back at hypercalcemia. So hypophosphatemia, not absorbing enough. Vitamin D issues, remember vitamin D helps you bring in phosphate, so not getting enough. And then things like antacid use can actually cause hypophosphatemia. So because the chemicals in the antacid bind to phosphate and they don't let you absorb it properly. Right. So, and before I go into the next chemical, look at this. Antacids are high in magnesium. So what would you expect to happen to magnesium levels at the same time as, as low phosphate levels if it's because of an antacid? You probably expect the magnesium to go up while the phosphate goes down. That's if it's because they're taking too many antacids. And then some of the symptoms, remember calcium and phosphate build bone. So some of the symptoms would be weaker bones, muscle weakness. Um, phosphate's important for just building the DNA inside of red blood cells. So you might see bleeding issues, you might see anemia. And then magnesium, the last one. Like I said, with magnesium, watch the antacids because usually magnesium issues are caused by antacid use. But magnesium, what it's there for is it actually helps calcium to work. So on smooth muscles, it helps calcium move into smooth muscles. So if you want a smooth muscle to contract, you let calcium in, which means you have to have calcium and you have to have magnesium present. It's also there for a lot of enzymes inside the cell to help regulate enzyme as a cofactor. So, oops, I skipped over one, sorry. It also binds to calcium or potassium receptors too. So when you look at hypomagnesium, you want to go back and look at, if you have too little magnesium, that means calcium is not going to work the same and potassium is not going to work the same. So the symptoms are similar to hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. So you get the neuromuscular irritability, the tetany, convulsions, etc. When you look at hypermagnesium, what do you want to think of with calcium? It's going to be similar to what? Low calcium or high calcium? It will be similar to high calcium or high potassium. So Magnesium is pretty easy. Typically, the causes revolve around antacids. So, taking away too many antacids in this situation. And you can see the symptoms, and the symptoms are going to be the same as the hypercalcemia, too. So, here's the big picture kind of key words to help you remind what happens in low potassium or high potassium levels. Key symptoms in, um, sorry, low calcium or high calcium. And then I had those two disorders you looked up and then phosphates and magnesium. So they're all there for you. There are no more questions in this video set. We'll talk to you in the next video.